Praise the Lord, everybody. Today's meditation is from First John, chapter two, verses one to six. <clears throat> I'll read these verses. Please observe carefully in your own Bibles. I'm reading from First John, chapter two, verse one onwards. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for us only, but also for the whole world. And by this we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected, by this know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. May the Lord add the blessing upon the reading of his word. Give to the Lord for help in prayer. A loving Heavenly Father, gracious God, thank thee for this scripture portion that could given unto us to meditate. Break this word, Lord, so that we may be filled. And me completely behind your cross, speak unto us. From thy heavenly throne, thy words only may be heard. Thy Son, Lord Jesus Christ, only may be manifested and glorified in our midst. We pray in the name of Lord and us in Jesus Christ. The letter to the believers given by John in his first letter. This letter's theme is fellowship. Fellowship is from Greek word koinonia which means having or sharing one life with Christ. So that is fellowship. And that's what John is mentioning here in first chapter. The first two verses is authenticating himself as the one who brings the message. And he writes here the purpose for this letter in verse 3 and 4. He says, we declare unto you that he also may have fellowship with us. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. God has saved us to have fellowship with him. Not only that, that he wants us to have fellowship with one another. And you see, if you observe this terminology in this letter, you observe that exhortation is mainly what he heard from Jesus in his private ministry with his disciples from John's Gospel, chapter 13 to 17. The addresses to, that is, the, to whom he has addressed the letter is the family, the family of believers. That's why he writes many times, little children. Little children is from another Greek word, technia means little born ones. So the believers in the family are addressed as little children, little born ones. Once they accepted Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior, they are born into the family of Lord Jesus Christ. There is another word that John uses here in this episode. That is 1 John chapter 2, verse 13 and 18. He uses another word, paideia. There also little children is mentioned. But the Greek word is different. Paideia are a, a little bit grown up children, like toddlers. So he expects these children to grow up and he's addressing them. This uh, paideia is one word from which we have this word, pediatrics, the wing of medicine which deals with diseases of children. Well, the purpose of the letter is once again, I'm mentioning his fellowship. So in this portion that we have read in the scripture, we have uh, uh, requirements of fellowship for this fellowship to continue and that we may grow in this fellowship. We have two requirements that is confession of sin and uh, keeping or obeying, obeying his to his commandments. If you look at the portion in the first two verses of chapter two, it about it's about um, Confession of sin. 
Actually, this uh, issue of confessing of sin starts in first chapter verse eight onwards. That's the portion of confession of sin, first chapter verse eight to second chapter verse two. See about uh, 350 years ago, the Bible was divided into chapters and verses. Before that, there were no chapters and verses. It was written like a, a letter. You may, you may be finding some paragraphs in that letter, like any other letter. These chapters and verses are divided like that. Sometimes they are divided halfway so that we get this confusion. So this confession of letter uh, sin comes from first chapter verse 8 onwards. So we look at that. Verse 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So when we are saved, that we, when we confess that we are sinners before God, accept Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we become the child of God. We have a, a relationship is established between us and Lord Jesus Christ. But that happens when we are still on this earth. So we become a new creation. Our spirit is quickened. But we know this body is with us. This body which has a sinful nature continues to be with us. That's why we, he says here, if we say that we have no sin means no sinful nature. We deceive ourselves. We must understand, accept that this body that we have, even though we are children of God, it has a tendency to commit sin. It has a sinful nature. But if we deny that, we will be only deceiving ourselves. There is a problem. It becomes a problem for us. But if we accept that fact, and then when we commit sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. You look at this verse 9. No. There, we confess our sins. That's the only action that we are needed to do. Confess our sins. The rest of it, he does it. He is faithful. He is just. And he forgives us and cleanses us from every unrighteousness. Verse 10. <clears throat> If we say that we have not sinned, that means because we have a sinful nature, it has a tendency to commit sin and we do sin. But if we deny that we have not committed any sin, that means we are denying that we have a sinful nature and we have, there is no sin in us. We, just, we are making him a liar. That doesn't help us to continue in fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. So the best way to continue to have fellowship with him is to confess our sins. Now, you look at chapter 2, verse 1. He has a mechanism here to help us in this matter. Chapter 2, verse 1 onwards, he says, Little children, these things I am writing to you that you do not sin. Well, that's best. That's the best situation where you don't sin. But it may not be possible. We do commit sin. That's why he continues in that verse, if any man sin, if any man sin, but we do sin. Now we have here a mechanism God has arranged for us, which helps us to keep this fellowship going on. That is, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now the word, Greek word for this advocate is paraclete, parakletos. Paraclete is the known form. He is a paraclete for us. Paraclete is a word which means one who comes along with us to help us. That is the meaning of paraclete. So the advocate is like a pleader who argues in our position in a court of law. Like that, here when we commit sin, the anger of the father is kindled against us because the wages of sin is death. One man of God explained like this. When we commit sin, the anger of the Father is kindled and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is on his right side, he pleads for us and he extends his hands and pleads, Oh, Father, I have bought that person. Please don't punish him. The Father looks at his hands of his son and he says, He's the wounds and then his anger is pacified. That's why we see in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 34, the Lord Jesus Christ, after his ascension, 
he is seated on the right hand of the father now what is he doing you see hebrews chapter 7 uh, verse 25 we see what he is doing here in hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 24 and 25 but this man because he continueth ever hath an unchangeable priesthood wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto him by him, God to God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So on the right hand side, what is he doing? He is doing an intercessory ministry for us. And, and he says he is able also to save them to the uttermost. Uttermost means complete. Pantelos is the word that is used in Greek. Even till the end, he makes that un, uh, the unstopping uh, intercessory ministry. Because of that, we can continue the fellowship with God. Well, that when we confess our sins, it is this paraclete, what he's doing for us on the right hand side of the Father, doing an intercessory ministry for us till the end, till it is complete. And uh, if you observe, there is another paraclete in the scriptures. In John's Gospel, chapter 14, in John's Gospel, chapter 14, and verse 16, it is says, I, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Here the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking in that private ministry with the disciples. He says, um, I will give another comforter when he goes back to the heaven to the be the father he sends an another comforter who shall be dwelling in us in verse 17 this comforter is the holy spirit god the holy spirit you know the greek word used for this comforter is also paraclete so one word in greek paraclete is translated as two different words in english in John's Gospel, it is translated as comforter. And in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, it is comforted. The same word paraclete is translated as an advocate. So one comforter is in heaven. That's what we see in 1 John chapter 2, 1. But another comforter, the Holy Spirit, is indwelling in us. Because he shall be in you, says verse 17. So when the church was inaugurated on Acts chapter 2, from then onwards, the Holy Spirit comes into the believer and lives in us forever. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, it is said, Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You are not your own. So our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So one paraclete is living in our heart. And he also helps us to confess. In John's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 8, it is written, and he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. That means he convicts us. His ministry is that. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, he says, My spirit shall not always strive with man. That means always he strives with our spirit to convict us of our sin, that we are sinners before God. That is ministry. So every person in this world is a believer or unbeliever. The Holy Spirit struggles with the spirit of man to convict him so that he can be saved. With the believer in a different way, he, is, he strives with our spirit. So whenever we commit sin, that we may confess it and, and the fellowship may be restored. So the fellowship to continue, we have two paraclets. God has given us two um, persons to help us to, to continue in this fellowship. This is very, very important. So when we are saved, we have become ch uh, children of God, a child of God. And that's a relationship is established. We have made a new creation. So for a believer, sin does not disturb relationship with God. That's always intact. We are saved forever. If they are genuinely saved. But fellowship is disturbed by sin. So when fellowship is disturbed, it has to be restored. The retro for that restoration, we have two paraclets to help us. Now, what how does he do that? In first John chapter 2, verse 2, he says, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for us only, but also for the whole world. 
So he is a propitiation. Propitiation is another uh, word which is translated from Greek word of hilasterion. Hilasterion is the price that is paid for sin. In Romans chapter 3 verse 25, you see that word propitiation. That propitiation is a price. It is an infinite price that he paid for our sins. So on, basis, on, on the basis, we are forgiven as of sin and that fellowship may be continued. So this propitiation, hilasterion, uh, is the word. But here in the in this verse, this propitiation is translated from another Greek word called hylasmos. It's a related word. Hylasmos. Hylasmos is uh, uh, a righteous demands are met. The righteous demands of the Father or righteous demands of the law are met by the sacrificial work of Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 9 verse 5, we see mercy seed there. There is another word which is Translated from Greek word hylasterion only. So hylasterion at one place is translated as propitiation. And another place it is translated as mercy seat. Hebrews is written to Hebrews and they know all the procedure. How the whole high priest goes and sprinkles the blood on the mercy seat. That's how they get forgiveness of uh, sins in a way. But we know that uh, both of these actually are pointing to the sacrificial work of Lord Jesus Christ. So here... A propitiation is a hylasmus, that is, the righteous demands of the law against sin are met by the sacrifice of Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we all get we get forgiveness of sins. And when we get once we get forgiveness of sins, fellowship can continue. That's that is a requirement of fellowship. Sins have to be forgiven. If sins have to be forgiven, a price has to be paid for that. That has been paid two thousand years ago by Lord Jesus Christ. And we also have to confess our sins. That's how sins are forgiven. And God says, I will remember their sins no more. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 17. The blood of Lord Jesus Christ, I say that it erases even our sins from the hard disk of God. And God even doesn't remember. Even if you remind him, he says, I don't know. Secondly, and the second requirement of fellowship is keep his commandments. Verse 3, he says, by this we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. This is a very particular English that um, John, uh, this letter is translated in a particular language that John uses, a very twisting language. No, it's a very complicated sentence that he uses. And by this we do know that we know him. The two times no is used, a twisting of language. You see, in... Uh, uh, Hoshea, book of Hoshea, chapter 6 and verse 3, book of Hoshea, which is after the book of Daniel, and uh, chapter 6, verse 3 says, Then shall we know if we follow on to know the law. That means, if you have one knowledge of uh, God and you obey his command, then God will lead you to higher knowledge of him. So, Knowledge leads to knowledge. One level of knowledge leads to another level of knowledge. God does not give all the commandments at one time. He does not give his uh, knowledge at one time. He leads us step by step. So one step after another step, he leads. So he, he, if we follow the, his commandments, we go on to know the law progressively. So when we go on to progress to know the Lord, you see what happens. In I'll skip verse 4 now. I'll go to verse 5. He says, But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. By this know we that we are in him. So here we see um, a triangle where it is. Uh, it starts with keep his commandments, and then it leads to knowledge. And also, the love of God is perfected. When the love of God is perfected, in verse 5, it leads to more knowledge. By this know, by this know we that we are in him. It is a spiraling up triangle. Once you keep your uh, his commandments, what are his commandments? His commandments start from Matthew's Gospel, 
uh, the Sermon on the Mount, what all Lord Jesus Christ has told us to do, all are his commandments. If you keep his commandments, our knowledge of him increases, our love of uh, to God is perfected, that increases more knowledge. So this is, goes on up, spiraling up a uh, triangle of our fellowship with God. So that's the provision that he has uh, kept for us of uh, keeping on and in increasing in the fellowship with God um, by keeping his commandments. And verse 6 says, <clears throat> and uh, he that saith he abideth, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. So he uses the word abiding. You know, abiding is a word which comes from um, he John's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 1 to 14, when the Lord speaks to he, his disciples of a wine tree and the branches in him. So the, in every branch that abides in him shall bring forth fruit and much fruit. So that is the meaning of abiding. It's Greek word meno here that is used when we are intact with the wine. We bring much more fruit. So abiding in Christ brings more fruit, results in fruit bearing. And that is, uh, for that, Christ is our example. Even John's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 15, says uh, the, the Lord was uh, washing the feet of his disciples. He says, I am doing it as an example. We should do it to one another. And also in First Peter chapter 2, verse 21, the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ is shown by Peter unto us as an example. So he's an example to us. You know, the life of Lord Jesus Christ was the one life lived on the face of the earth, the most perfect life. There are billions of people born in this uh, world from the beginning. And to no man, God, Father, to, could give a, a testimony that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He could give that testimony only to one person on this earth, that is Lord Jesus Christ. All are sinners. So he is the best and perfect life he ever lived on the face of the earth. We have to study that life. That's why these four Gospels are given. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ lived on this earth. So we must be thorough with these Gospels and try to follow that life which the Lord has set as an example for us. So uh, he, as he walked, we should walk. Then we can keep that fellowship with God, uninterrupted. So uh, let us now come to verse 4. Verse 4 is, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So here is another claim that a person can make. Here in verse 6 says, He that saith, he, he, that saith, he abideth. But here is another man who is claiming something else. Is the he that saith, I know him. So here also another person, he, he makes a similar claim that I know him and keepeth not his commandments. So what he is claiming and what he is doing are not going together. They are different ways. He is actually not keeping his commandments, but continues to say that I know him. So what we should call him? And John calls him a liar, as if that is not sufficient. He gives a second confirmatory statement that truth is not in him. So he is a false man. He is a liar. He is not a disciple of Lord Jesus. He does not belong to the fellowship. But he is a liar and he is trying to come into this fellowship. But these are dangerous people. These are the people uh, which are a hindrance to fellowship. In many churches, I visit many churches, I find in almost any churches, you find such people. People who say they are disciples of Lord Jesus Christ, but they are liars. They are, do not keep the commandments of God. There is nothing common that they have with the true children of God. Such people are very, very important uh, that we should avoid and be careful about them. We can't avoid them. You see, uh, in uh, second parable of uh, the kingdom parables in Matthew's gospel, chapter 13, the Lord Jesus Christ told a parable of wheat and tares, where wheat are being sown by the son of man, 
but envy comes in the night and so stares among the wheat. These two plants grow together. You know, the wheat plant is one thing and the stairs plant is, uh, in a botani botanical terms, it is called flaris minor. The flaris minor plant is resembled just like a wheat plant. You cannot differentiate. So the angels came and said, we'll pluck out these stairs here. Why should they grow, grow with wheat? But they cannot identify. And at the roots level, they're so intertwined with the uh, wheat plants that they will harm the wheat plants also. So when can we differentiate them? When they put out their corn at the harvest time. When wheat puts out its corn, it, it's a wheat uh, corn. Whereas this uh, tears, it puts out a different useless corn. Then you can easily differentiate. That's why uh, in that episode, then that uh, parable, sorry, in that parable, these are plucked out at the time of harvest. Then easily you can separate and the tears can be burnt. And weeds, they can be brought into the uh, barns. That's how that uh, parable explains. These people are there in the fellowship, but they're a problem for fellowship. That's why you must be careful how to deal with these people. Well, how to deal with that's a different thing. thing. But what is a hindrance to fellowship? You must observe here. That is, if you do not keep the commandments of God, we become liars and we are an obstacle for fellowship. So you must keep his commandments. So all this portion that we have uh, with us, First John, uh, one and two chapters, we uh, there are requirements of fellowship. In these requirements of fellowship, first requirement is we have already seen last thing: walk in the light. The second requirement is confess your sins for the fellowship to continue. The third requirement is keep his commandments. So these are requirements uh, of fellowship. Uh, may the Lord help us to uh, keep these instructions in mind uh, so that fellowship will continue with God, with the Father and the Son, and even with one another. May the Lord bless his word.